Hello, my name is Lisa Roger from Otimo, and I want to welcome you to the CIO podcast. On this show, we seek to share insights and experiences from the world's leading CIOs and transformation agents. So tune in if you're a CIO or an entrepreneur looking for inspiration. Welcome. Well, welcome to the CIO podcast by Lisa with the esteemed Scott Frost. <laughs> Scott is a, the CIO for Three Pillar Global and has been with this company for three and a half years, but he has a very diverse background, over 28 years of experience. It has a passion for building world-class technology teams, modernizing systems, scaling organizations with a big focus on reliability and security. He has led major projects engineering enterprise modernization efforts. Um, and he's done that at Science Logic, Hobson, AOL, Discovery Channel, General Electric, Harvard Business, uh, Harvard University, I should say, Chicago Public Schools and the US Chamber of Commerce. Just a wonderful experience. Uh, he also has a BS of uh, Management Science from Virginia Tech. Uh, so he's a Hokie. Uh, mm -hmm. he's, no he's Hokie. Yeah, go Hokies. Uh, he has served as a mentor for several local high school and college technology programs uh, for inspiring future uh, generations of technologists. And he enjoys staying active with his two boys uh, and coaching baseball. So welcome, Scott. Hey, Lisa. Great to great to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. This is just so awesome to have you here. Uh, uh, but before we get started, I would love for everyone to hear a little bit about Three Pillar Global. Can you Tell us a little bit about what you guys do, what your superpowers are. Absolutely. So Three Pillar Global is a global product development organization. We're about 2,500 employees uh, globally, and we support major companies and organizations in their digital transformation journeys, building products, modernizing their platforms, and uh, realizing really high-end customer experiences for their products and for their platforms. So very excited to be here. I was actually a a client of Three Pillar about a decade ago. So I had a team from uh, Romania who was helping build our EdTech product at the time. So very excited to, to be here and uh, help the co company continue to grow and scale. Oh, that's wonderful. That's great. Isn't it funny how it works sometimes? Crazy, uh, the connections yeah. that you make and <laughs> how it, it can shift your career one day, a customer the next day, you're running the, running the show. There we go. I love it. Yeah. All right. So how I like to start each of these podcasts is a little icebreaker, something. Okay that we like to call rapid fire. For those of you who have not heard this before, Scott is gonna be given two options and he's going to quickly respond to the first one that pops into his head without explanation. So are you comfortable, Scott? Are you ready? I'm, I'm ready. I was born ready for this. Here we go. <laughs> All right, here we, here we go. Unix or Windows? Unix. Country or rock? Rock. Hamburgers or hot dogs? Hot dogs. Texting or calling? Calling. Mac or PC? Um, Mac. Don't Although I, it's so funny. Engineers yeah. can never follow directions yeah. on this game. Right. Okay, right. thank there you for proving me out. But okay, we're gonna keep going. <laughs> we're gonna keep going. Standard or automatic? Uh, standard. Samsung or iPhone? iPhone. Printing or cursive? Printing. On prem or in the cloud? In the cloud. Star Trek or Star Wars? Ooh, wow, wow. Star Pick Wars. one, pick Star one. Wars. Okay. All right, on yeah. that one, on that one, I'll let you do an explanation. Why Star Wars over Star Trek? Well, they're both they're both so different, right? Star Wars is, is really fantasy. Star Trek is sci-fi. So it's kind of like, all right, which, which one do you pick? Star Wars will always have a special place, but Star Trek, how can you go wrong, right? Like you just throw it on and... There's yeah. like lessons, there's really innovative technologies in there, they're forward thinking, they have to deal with uh, deal with, with troubles and challenges. So it's pretty much what we do as CIOs, right? Like that's There you go. We're all Captain Kirk in our own kind of way, right? Or Picard. Or yeah. Picard. Or Captain yeah. Kirk. Take your pick, right? I'm a new next generation girl. So I love it. I love it. There you go. All right. Perfect. You did almost okay. Like that <laughs> you, had, you had that slip up. Yeah, you yeah. had that slip up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh I haven't met an engineer yet who can't get through that without having to 
have, <laughs> have, have to like trip and, and do it. So it's kind I of fun it. for me to do I it. I love it. All right. Well, let's get to the, the topic of, of the year for us here uh, at sure. Otema, really talking about digital transformation. And I'd love to hear about your experience, about your philosophy or, or approach. So let's just start off with, in general, what's the biggest challenge like with the digital transformation journey? you know, that you faced and, you know, how did you deal with it? It's a great question. I know a lot of leaders deal with this, uh, especially from a technology perspective. And I always say that it's not the technology, it's the people. And so I think the biggest challenge that anybody will face in embarking on either a new product platform that they want to build in their organization, or whether it's a, a uh, optimization initiative at a company to create efficiencies and and automate, really you have to focus on the people and it's the transformation of mindset, it's the transformation of processes, it's the transformation of how they operate as, as a company that I think is the biggest hurdle to a successful transformation project. And like I said, whether it's building a product from scratch or modernizing a platform or the internal back office enterprise upgrades and changes that, that companies go through as they scale, it's always gonna be about the people and so I think if you go in with a lens of managing relationships across a business, making sure that you have strong communication in place, you're doing weekly newsletters, you're creating micro sites uh, internally that can help guide the narrative around where you're taking this project, what's going on, what are the successes, what are the wins, uh, that's really gonna gonna go a long way. You're gonna the, the technology piece of it. You're gonna you're gonna hire people. You're gonna bring in vendors, you're gonna bring in partners who are gonna do all that. Like to me, the technology part isn't isn't the issue. It's the transformation of, of the organization and the change management. That leads me to think of challenges based on culture. Can, can you talk a little bit about the cultural thread with that? I love where you're going. Or how have you seen that manifest or, or cause issues or or make it easier? So one of the one of the common things I've heard in my career is is well that's the way we've always done it and that's i that mindset to me is very limiting and so you have to focus on the the mindset of the organization and, and the people that are involved with the project think outside the box think beyond where you're going because if you are let's say you're doing an internal transformation project for modernizing your you know talent systems or your finance systems you, you have to really embrace the best practices of the platforms that you're bringing to, to bear, because the way you've been doing it all these years is probably not the best way to do it. And I've, I've heard this time and again, where companies will take you know, their way of doing things and they'll try to cram it into a platform that has, I don't know, a thousand clients running it very well or successfully. And so really trying to get that mindset of, well, how do we shift our business? How do we shift our mindset uh, to, to adopt and embrace the best practices, I think is really, is really a key uh, on the culture side of it. And then uh, just bringing people together to a, to a beacon uh, for what success looks like for the organization. So making sure that people understand why are we, why are we embarking on this journey together? Because there's going to be, storms there's going to be ups there's going to be downs there's going to be uh, battles that we have to engage in across the way you know let's make this a, an epic hero journey if you will and we have to come together as a team and i think that making sure that you've got a beacon objective in mind is really really key to getting everybody to rally around uh, that beacon and then i think you know finally one, one thought on this as well is from the top down in, in the at the executive level the executives have to be bought in to why a company is doing something. And if they're not, if you're listening to this podcast right now and your executive is not bought into what we're doing and they're not talking about it all the time with other people, you need to go have a, a frank conversation with them. Because if the top down is not engaging with this initiative that you're embarking on, then people don't understand it. They don't really see the value of it overall. So from my perspective, that's how you get that cultural shift, that mindset, getting everybody to start operating together uh, towards towards those objectives. I love it. I love the beacon. I love the getting the top down. It's, I think you you and I probably both have had done transformations where you haven't had that top down 
and it's, yeah. yep, you it's, set yourself up for failure, right? It, it's hard, and and you end up, you know, I, I I often say that we in in sort of the back office roles, you know, we in in business technology, we're leading the company in in a lot of respects to to where we have to try to get, and I think the biggest challenge, and and I hear this all the time, and I know you have, is we don't own the technology, right? Like the office of the CIO does not own the tool. We don't own the finance system. We don't own talent systems. We don't own the marketing system. The business owners actually own that. And I think that's an education process that that I've gone through many times with leaders to, to make sure they actually understand. Because sometimes they think, oh, well, they're, they're just cramming it down our throats. You know, we have to take it because of X, Y, and Z. It's like, no, 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 no. We're in this together. You own it. If this is not something you want, let's talk about what makes sense for the business. Let's talk about how we can achieve a, a transformation together to get you where you need to be. And I think that's a little bit of a, a shift that, that folks have to go through in, in truly understanding that, that they own it. I don't care, right? You ask right. Mac, Linux, you know, or you ask, uh, you know, uh, Windows, Linux, uh, Unix, Windows, <laughs> you ask PC, Mac. It's sort of like, I don't, I struggle with that because I'm technology agnostic. I don't care what the tool is. I really don't care. It's, are we getting the right tool at the right price? at mm -hmm. this point in time with what we know to make the right decision about how we're going to propel our business forward. So from my perspective, it's it's really about educating folks that this is a, a process that they own, but we're here to help support that in that journey. Yeah, I mean, what you're talking about is being a business partner versus a technology guy with a hammer, you know, just shoving something into into the organization that they don't want and don't understand. You've got to have those two butts in the seat. I love it. Absolutely yeah. love it. I, you know, you, you just said two butts in the seat, right? Two the the two but the two in the box approach. Mm -hmm. if, if nobody, right. if you're not familiar with two in the box, it's it's tried and true. It's it works, and you know, getting yeah. two leaders who are held accountable for the success mm -hmm. of an initiative together, I think is, is a really valuable, uh, is a really valuable tool. And, you know, it's funny because you, you mentioned mentoring earlier, you know, I mentor mm -hmm. leaders and I mentor high school and, and college uh, uh, students. I always ask the, the college students, I tell them, you know, if, if I'm mentoring them or I'm in a room, I ask them, what, what's the number one class you need to be taking in college right now? And they're all technologists, right? So they say, oh, yeah. you know, computer science uh, level 400, right? Or, <laughs> or you know, uh, uh, architecture in the cloud, you know, or cybersecurity. I'm like, nope, 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 wrong, wrong, wrong. And they never, nobody ever gets this right. And I say, yeah, the number one class you need to be taking is communication or public speaking. Yes. And the reason why that's so important is because to your point, you have to be able to articulate that partnership with leaders in an organization and so that to me is the most important skill set is being able to to collaborate to talk through things not sit in the back room coding away writing that that you're, that's a recipe for disaster so you know that to me public speaking building those relationships across an organization you know in, in teams at three pillar or even in my career i've, I've coached uh, people who've reported to me and i've always said you need to build relationships I don't care if you're not working with them right now, take them to lunch, go, uh, you know, go get together, meet with them, ask them what's on their mind, learn about the business, because at some point we're going to circle and go, oh, they're now a priority. We have to work with them. And so those relationships will pay dividends uh, in, into the future. I love it. I love it. I love it. I'm, it is. I love how you pulled that from the beginning to the end. And it really is, whether it's that beacon that you were talking about and that vision that you need to get the entire enterprise to not only see the beacon, buy into it, you know, uh, take on you take on that mission together. You can't do that if you're not a good communicator. And uh, you can't do that if you, you stay in the, the basement with IT with the door closed, right? You gotta be that business partner. So when you think back on the transformations that you've done and the lessons learned that you've had, uh, communication is a big part. Being agnostic is a big part. Is there something else that we really need to be mindful of uh, when you think back um, to some of the transformations that you've done? Oh, we could we could talk for hours. Uh, you know, we so there, there's uh, Jenny Fimbris in in, in uh, our organization. I've worked with her for many, many, many years. 
uh, we always use the term we have the we have the scars, we have the battle wounds mm -hmm. from from you know all these projects. I mean, you, you think about the craziest things that that could happen uh, on any project, and there's a lot of things that actually you you don't anticipate. So I one of the biggest things that I like to do with with our teams when we start out a, a an initiative is uh, do a pre mortem. So if you're not familiar with pre mortem, if, if you're listening to this, go look up what a pre mortem is. Uh, you know, most people do post mortems. Oh, we right. went live. Let's talk about post. -mortem. Well, the pre mortem is actually before you go live. You sit in a room with key stakeholders and you talk through. Okay, we're about to go live in two months. What could possibly happen that prevents us from achieving the success metrics we've set out to achieve? So. You're actually planning and thinking about that beforehand in a lot. And I guarantee you, you're going to come up with stuff where you're like, oh, you know what? Oops, we didn't think about that. We didn't we didn't anticipate this or, or we didn't put enough attention on training or education. And if we go live and our, our team isn't trained or our clients, or our customers are not trained on the product or we don't have the right education tools in place. They're not going to. They're not going to embrace it. So I, I pre mortems to me are are such a, a valuable tool to help really anticipate. Okay, what are we going to really achieve what we set up to do or, or not? And then I think the other thing too is a lot of folks don't look enough at the KPIs and the ROI of of an initiative. Right. And so one of the things that, that I love doing, I love process flows. I've been I started out at Capgemini, they have the brown paper process at Capgemini, so it's ingrained into my, my bloodstream. But I love capturing the as-is workflow of a process of a product, uh, you know, quote to cash, right? Let's pick on quote to cash. That's a big one for, for CIOs. If, if you don't have your quote to cash process mapped out, you need to get off this call and you need to go map out your quote to cash process because then what you do is you take a red pen and you start circling the areas of the workflow where you have inefficiencies in the in the process and you can literally define what those inefficiencies are so let's say your your month end close process in finance takes 20 days right to, to close the books every month that's a long right. time sure. guess what it exists there's a lot of companies that that have that issue so you can start to circle within that workflow well what's causing that expansion of time and suddenly you have some metrics that you can measure against and say, okay, if we take on this project and we do this transformation, we are anticipating we're gonna collapse this metric by X factor and boom, next thing you know, you're closing your books in five or six days every, every month. So, you know, I think, I think really measuring the baseline of the as is model is so important. And a lot of people don't do that. They just jump in, hey, we're gonna, we're going off. It's gonna be amazing. We're, we're going to get to the other side and the grass is going to be sparkling emerald green and it's going to be so spectacular. And then we get there and it's like weeds everywhere. And we're like, what, what happened? <laughs> well, because we didn't know what we were, were trying to right. solve for. And, you know, I think that kind of dovetails into the ROI conversation. Right, right. And what, how do you measure that? And especially up front when you're not sure, how, how do you approach that? What do you do, Scott? Well, it's quantitative or qualitative, right? And so to, to me, even if there's a qualitative measure that you want to take, you can actually, you can come up with a calculation to figure out what that costs the company. Uh, years ago, I created this uh, high value versus noise exercise that I take Love it. Teams I love through. the name of that. Love the name yeah. of that. High value versus <laughs> noise. And, and yeah, I should patent it, copyright, whatever. But <laughs> essentially, I, I take teams through it and the idea is to distinguish between what is the high value work that they should be doing mm -hmm. to help the company versus the noise that they have going on on, a, on an everyday basis. And I, I, I'm not lying. I've had people tell me, oh, this is a waste of my time. I don't want to do this exercise. It only takes like 30 minutes. It's a quick exercise. It's a waste of my time. I'm already doing all high value work. And then they go through it and they're like, huh, I didn't realize I had never stepped back to look at I'm really wasting time here. And so when you do that and apply it to a digital transformation project or modernization effort, people will, will suddenly see, whoa, wow, we didn't realize that was a problem or we were so heads down in it, we didn't understand this level of noise that was going on. So if you, if you measure what the impact of that is, you can quantify it. And so I think defining those, those metrics for your KPIs as well as the ROI of what you're gonna get out of it 
is very important. And then one other one other uh, comment on ROI, real quick. You've had this. I've had this. Where somebody comes and says, "We want to do this." I say, "Well, why? To what purpose do you want this metric? What purpose do you want this report? Why do you want this change made? What is it actually going to do for the company?" And a lot of times they cannot answer that question. And so I've worked to try and educate other leaders or stakeholders in the, in, in the organization to let's justify why you actually want to do this. Because if you say that we're going to save, you know, $120,000 by implementing this change, we're actually going to go back and measure that. And we're going to want to show a reduction of $120,000 in your operational budget, or we repurpose that money for other things. And a lot of times they, they don't see you coming. They, they say, not expecting oh, hey, we're live. It's the awesome. IT like, guy. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, where's that 120K that you said we were going to save? And and so that goes back all the way to our, our opening conversation. We have to shift the mindset of the organization to be data driven, to be ROI driven, to really truly understand what are we solving for and what's it actually going to do for us at, at the end of the day. I love it, Scott. Yeah. Such nuggets of wisdom, everything from, you know, what to take in college. Uh, to the beacon, to the uh, stand-up skills and speaking, to don't forget the process and find the noise. Um, wow, this is just like, this is like a one-on-one -on, -one on transformation. <laughs> I cannot thank you enough. But oh, yeah. before I let you go, I always sure. like to ask this question. A lot of people might be listening to this, and especially people young in their careers who aspire to be Scott Frost, who again, Orby winner, capital B. <laughs> like he's got the trophy um so if if we want to be scott frost what is our what's the advice that you have for our young aspiring uh engineers and tech technicians that that want to be a cio one day what should what should they focus on i think they should the, the biggest thing is to understand the business and like I said, the technology, you'll get your search, you'll you'll learn the skill sets. Those are hard skills and technology is gonna change. I, I you know, I love Visual Basic back in the in the in the 90s. <laughs> like I was I was addicted to Visual Basic. If I was still a Visual Basic programmer, I'd be out of a job, right? Uh, it, was, it was such a great, a great platform. So the technology changes. So I wouldn't focus too much on technology. I would really understand and learn about how business works right if if you if you aspire to that get an mba uh get involved if you go into an organization build those relationships across the organization don't just stay in engineering don't just stay in it go start talking to people in talent go start talking to people in marketing because as you expand and grow in your career you have to understand all the aspects of operating and running a business. You know, the, the the technology, the security stuff, definitely you have to know that. Those are table stakes. But really I think the, the biggest piece of advice I have is build those those business relationships. And then, you know, one other thing is as you go in your career, surround yourself with fantastic partners. So, you know, Otimo has been a great partner to me over the years. Uh, I, I love Otimo and, and I know we've three pillars partner with Otimo as well. So we're kind of the dynamic duo, right? To go back to the Batman theme. That's right. Uh, yeah. So, but, uh, you know, surround yourself with good, good people, surround yourself with good partners and, and rely on them, right? You, you can't do it all. Your teams can't do it all. So where it makes sense, you know, bring someone like Otimo in to, to help you out. Uh, or, as well. th or three pillar or three pillar. Yeah. Hey, we're both here to, to help in, in those digital transformation journeys. That's right. Well, Scott, I can't thank you enough for spending time uh, with me today and on my very first podcast. So um, I've just uh, warms my heart. I really appreciate your wisdom, your sharing, the time that you spent. Um, and uh, thank you. No, thank you, Lisa. I, I'm very humbled to, to be the first one on your podcast. It's going to be an amazing, amazing journey for you. And it's been such a pleasure working with you over the years. And I look forward to our future collaborations. It's going to be awesome. All right. Well, All right. take care. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks so much.